I have like this mountain of stuff that I want to share with you guys. And I was like, man, how do I pick? How do I choose? How do I allow God to impress upon me what it is you guys need to hear? So here's what I'm settling on. I've got three ways that I have been challenged uh, by Scripture. Um, or excuse me, three challenges I've faced in life, one of which was challenged by Scripture. I have a story of three individuals that I want you to pay attention to tonight. Um, first one is this. Uh, when I was a junior in college, I was taking a uh, philosophy class. Part of this class, uh, it was kind of annoying because we had had these, the whole class was basically about debating about uh, arguing logic and all of these things, and like there was an annoying level to this class. But one of the assignments we had over the course of the semester was to read this classic book called The Republic, and it was by a guy named Plato, and it was written like B.C., and so it wasn't like reading a Harry Potter book, to say the least. It was not necessarily entertaining. And so I wasn't that motivated to do it. We were supposed to do it over the 20-week course of, or an 18-week course of a semester, something like that. It was like read a chapter, journal about what you're reading, do all of this. This is like welcome to college. And guess what I didn't do the entire semester? That book sat on my dresser the entire semester until 6 p.m. the night before it was due. I had an entire book to read, an entire semester of journaling. I was overwhelmed with what I had done to myself. I did not sleep for, for the next 20, let's see, it was a night class, so I did not sleep. I went like 36 hours, maybe longer with that. No, because I went to class. I was up for like 48 hours, counting like Saturday and Sunday and into Monday. 20 pages, single-spaced, like you guys that do double spit. you're like, man, I had to do a three-page paper double-spaced and had to cite my sources. 20 pages, single-spaced, hand that puppy in, 6 o'clock on Monday, got it done. I wish I could sit here and tell you that I never procrastinated ever again, but that is not true. It's somewhere in my genetics. Any other procrastinators in here? You guys put stuff off? Man, make better choices. Make better. I am not preaching that. I'm preaching make better choices. You kidding me? Man, that'll make your life miserable. Second time I felt overwhelmed with something. The house that my family lives in now had a water issue. Uh, that water would literally pour into our garage when we would get a heavy rain. And when, when I say it would pour in... Um, if you could picture like someone pointing a fire hydrant into the door that came into our garage and just turning it on, it literally, a heavy rain, it would come in the door and like there was no stopping the water. Um, I called my friend Ted. Ted brought a truck over and dumped. Ted, are you in here? Is Ted here yet? I know Ted said he's going to be here tonight. I can't remember. I think he dumped 20 ton of dirt, 20 or 10, something like that. And he was like, hey, you need help moving this? And uh, Prideful Josh was like, nah, I'm good. I got a wheelbarrow and a shovel. I'll, I'll get it done. And like, I remember having to get this done. It was like a scoop, wheelbarrow, scoop, wheelbarrow, one at a time as I built this massive berm to divert water from my entire yard so it wouldn't come into my house. And, and all of those things, you guys, I remember feeling overwhelmed because of the task at hand, thinking, there's no way. There's no way that I'm capable. There's no way that I will be able to live up to what needs to be done here. And ironically enough, two weeks ago, my small group that I'm a part of, we've been reading through the book of James. And in James chapter 2, if you guys have your Bible apps, you want to get your phones out, not to check Instagram or Snapchat or whatever you're on. If you want to get your Bible app out, open up to James chapter 2. I want to talk to you about one of the most convicting pieces of Scripture that I've, uh, that I've ever read in my life. This is James, they would say the brother of Jesus, talking about what you say you believe and how you live. All right? So I want you to listen to this. James chapter 2, starting with verse 14. What good is it? My brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, hey, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself 
This is the part that just kicks me in the shins right here. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. I had to take a long, hard look at my faith. And this literally stopped me in my tracks. And I'll tell you that every time that I read this, I reevaluate where I'm at spiritually. And students, I honestly hope that maybe you're in the same place tonight. We've been talking about this man named Abraham. Abraham was awarded in Scripture and recognized as a man of faith. Uh, he was a man whose, whose faith stood the test. He was a guy that, that uh, if you remember, we've been talking about him. God promised him a family, and God provided him a son named Isaac when he was an old, old, old man. Scripture would say like around 90 years old, he gets to have a baby. That's just like on the borderline of like awesome but creepy weird, right? Like old man, old woman having a baby. Here's what happened. God wanted to bring him to a point of saying, Abraham, I need to know. Does the way that you live truly match up with what you say? Is your faith truly founded in me? Is your faith genuine? Or are you trusting in me? Or are you trusting in simply the son that I've provided? And he says, Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to this place that I'm going to show you, and here's what you're going to do. You can imagine confusion in his head. He goes, I want you to sacrifice this son to me as a burnt offering. Totally weird. God doesn't make this request of, of like, he's never asked me to sacrifice my son. I can't imagine what was going on in Abraham's head. Abraham turns to his servants. He says this. He says, hey, me and my son, we're going to go over there. We're going to worship, and, and, and we're going to, then we'll be back in a few days. So the cool thing about this is this, is that Abraham was going to be obedient, and he was trusting whatever God's provision was going to be whether he was trusting in the resurrection of his son or whether he was trusting that God was going to do something else, Abraham trusted God in that moment. And I want you guys to know something about this story. Isaac, Scripture says that Isaac is the one that carried the wood for the sacrifice. Now, if that would be enough wood to consume an entire animal, it would be a lot of wood that would have to be carried by a stout young man. We're not talking about a little baby. We're not talking about a little toddler. We're talking about someone that, that is likely of you guys' age somewhere in that range. How many of you in here could outrun grandpa if he went crazy and wanted to kill you with a knife? You know what I'm saying? So here's Isaac. Everybody talks about the faith of Abraham. Isaac trusted his father. Isaac carried the wood. Not only was he big enough to carry the wood, he was hiking up a mountain carrying the wood for a burnt offering, and he carries it up, and you picture him being, being a healthy young man, and, and, and uh, he's looking around, and he knows how this whole faith thing works, and he goes, hey, Dad, hey, uh, hey where's, where's the sacrifice? Where's it at? And Abraham looks at him and says, son, God will provide. God will provide. Stories of faith in Scripture. There's another story of faith in Scripture that's equally as incredible. There's a story of a man named Peter. Now, you guys need to know that Peter was one of Jesus' closest followers. Jesus had some of his followers that were maybe closer than others, and Peter was one of those. Peter was one of the guys that... that Maybe Jesus looked at and maybe saw some, like, man, phenomenal potential in. And here's what happened. The disciples were, were out in a boat. Huge storm comes up. Anybody ever, like, been out on, like, McConaughey or Sherman during a storm? Man, it's terrifying. Like, and those are small bodies of water. I've been out on a big lake in, like, a little 10-foot boat. And I was with a friend, and we were, like, trying to get back to the dock because this storm had just rolled in. And it was, like, boogie because we're like ramping these, these, uh, these waves. But these guys were stuck. It was, it was wind-driven boats. 
You imagine being terrified you're at the mercy of a sea. Swells that are higher than your vessel. Peter looks out and he sees someone. First he thinks it's a ghost because Jesus was coming to catch up with him and he realizes who it was. And at this point, Jesus or Peter understood who Jesus was. He says, he says Jesus, is that you? If that is really you, tell me to come to you on the water. Man, could you imagine asking Jesus to do that? In the middle of a storm, it wasn't like, it wasn't like placid. It wasn't like glass water that you see on a pond in the morning. It was reckless waves, and it was all of this. And he's saying, Jesus, if it's truly you, tell me to come to you. And here's Peter. Jesus says, Jesus says, come on. Peter has a decision to make. Peter has a decision on whether or not his faith is going to be put into action. He's surrounded by peers that could be looking at him and going, dude, you're stupid. Peter, what what are you doing? What do you think that you're doing? No. Jesus is coming. Chill. He's going to be here. You have Peter sitting there going, I know that he's God. I know that he's God. And if he tells me to come, I can come. And then you see Peter not only listening to the doubt of his peers saying, hey, don't be the idiot. Don't be the only one to do it. But he's looking out and going, this is terrifying. I don't know if I can handle this. You guys, Isaac in the same boat. When his father looked at him and says, son, I want you to lay down on this altar. I want you to lay down. Here's where I want you to be. Isaac going, but dad, but dad, I'm the one. He could could have been thinking all of that. It was in that moment that Isaac was having to decide, was his action going to match his faith students? Here it is for you. So many of you, as you sit in one of these chairs tonight, and you proclaim the name of Jesus, you do it in this room on a Wednesday night, you might dare to do it in this room on a Sunday morning. James chapter 2 is pointing at me and going, Josh, your faith without action is dead. Students, James is speaking directly to your hearts, asking the exact same question that was on Peter's heart, that was in the mind of Isaac as his father was asking him to lay upon an altar. Are your actions going to match the faith that you say you have? You guys can be seated. It would be cruel of me to leave you in that tension of what it is that God would be asking of you. Man, that song, Oceans, being perfect, following the story of Peter. Like I said, Peter was in that boat with peers that were doubting. Likely. Don't do it. You don't know what's going to happen. Hey, you're not going to be the only one, are you, Peter? Peter, don't do that alone. And you could see him on the edge looking at these, these waves that would have been dark and ominous and destructive for a fisherman, for a sailor. They knew the danger of stepping outside of that boat. Scripture says that Peter chose to take that step. He did something that no one else in his world was willing to do. It was a moment where he took the opportunity to take his faith and the action of his life and marry them together like this. And we got to witness that. 
We got to witness his obedience. You absolutely did do it. And like, here's the thing, like, like here's Dante recognizing that his need for Jesus and going, you know what? I need to put my faith in action. I need to put my faith where I say my heart is. And that's where James chapter two is. So often we look at that word deeds, faith without deeds is dead. And I think of this students, I think about when I hear good deeds, I'm like, okay, so Josh is telling me I gotta help the old lady carry your groceries out. Uh, it just snowed, I'm gonna go scoop their sidewalk. Uh, the good deeds, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my homework when I'm supposed to. I'm not putting off my 20 page paper till the end of the semester and the good deeds. I'm gonna put my dishes away, I'm put my brother, no. It's different than that. Your faith, unless it changes the way that you live, unless your faith changes the way that you talk, the way that you interact, you guys are surrounded with moments, even from the moment that you walked into this building tonight, many of you are, are face to face with a with possibly a dramatic relational situation in this building tonight. And you know what? God is asking you, is your faith going to match up with your action in that moment? And are you, choose gonna, are you going to make the decision to go, you know what? I'm going to allow my faith to impact my actions. And you know what? I'm done with the drama. I'm just going to offer compassion and forgiveness. I'm done with it. Students, for you, the boat is when you're in the basement of their house watching a movie with a blanket over your laps, and it's at that moment where it's going, am I going to allow my faith to change the way that I live, and are my actions going to be different in this moment? It's the moment when you've got your phone out and you're alone in your bedroom and the lights are off and you're surfing the internet. You're going to be face to face with a decision. Am I going to allow my faith to impact my actions? It's the moment that you're on social media and you see the juicy opportunity to absolutely trash them online, and you've got the perfect line that you would post, the perfect zinger that would put them in their place for good. Students, it's your moment in the boat. Will you be frozen by the peers going, yeah, do it, do it. Yeah, post it, post it. No, 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 add this to it. Put this emoji behind it because it'll make them think this. And if you remind them about this, oh man, they're gonna, they're gonna feel horrible. Add that, do it. Are you gonna listen to that? Or are you gonna step out of the boat and allow your faith to match up with your actions? Students, you're, you're, you're Isaac. You are Isaac in that moment going, okay, here's the deal. Old man's telling me to get up on here. I, I, I know that I could, I could outrun him at the very least. I don't know what he's thinking, but you choose to lay down wondering what's going to happen. Are you going to allow your faith to match up with your actions? Because here's what happens, students. In Isaac's situation, God provided a sacrifice. God said, hey, Abraham, I can see that you have not withheld your son whom you love. And there was a sacrifice that was provided for him. And he and, he and his son got to sacrifice and worship God together. Peter stepped out of the boat and literally walked on water. Will you allow your faith to match up with actions? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane had faith that God would follow through with what he said he was going to do. And he said, all right, God, let's do it.
Students, you know what your boat is that you need to step out of. Look, God is not looking for perfection. Peter, this guy that was willing to step out of a boat and to walk on water, he publicly denied even knowing who Jesus was the night that he was arrested. Peter was far from perfect. In fact, he didn't just deny God Jesus once, he did it three times publicly to the point of cursing and yelling at someone saying, look, I don't even know who Jesus is. Leave me alone. I tell you that because I've told you guys this over and over again, that God is not looking for perfection. Students, he's looking for obedience. Peter was obedient. Isaac was obedient. Abraham was obedient. Their faith changed the way they lived. Their faith was matched up with action. And students, I will tell you this to be completely honest with you. You got to hear this. I struggle with this. I struggle with making sure that my faith is always matched up with my actions. And you know what? I fail. I'm flesh and bones just like you, just like Peter. Peter stepped out of the boat. He took a few steps and then he started to doubt and he started to sink. It isn't perfection that God wants. He wants obedience and he's wanting you to go, man, will you choose to allow your faith to change the way you live? Because students, faith, according to James, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. And I do not want you to have a dead faith. I want your faith to be living and active and working in your homes, in your friendships, in your classrooms. That is what God wants for you. Father, I pray for these students. Father, I, I'm, I'm in that. I pray for all of us in this room as we struggle with James chapter two, Father, the conviction of does, does our actions line up? Do our actions line up with, with our faith? Father, if we need to repent, I pray that we would repent tonight in our small groups, with our coaches, with our friends, that we would find our place in a position of prayer and honesty with you. Father, help us to see where it is in our lives that we need to put our faith to work in action. And Lord, help us to be the ones that would step out of the boat. Help us to be the ones that take that courageous step, Lord. That step towards you, that step that would be a witness to everyone else, to the glory of what you're doing. Help us to be that church. Help us to love that way. In the name of Jesus, amen.